Well, our human achievements are pretty astonishing. Can you believe that we actually have had a man on the moon? Now, I wonder whether you know at home how many moon landings there have been. Maybe you're a bit of a, uh, a moon landing geek and you know all the details. Uh, between 1969 and 1972, uh, there were six missions that landed on the moon. We haven't been on the moon for almost 50 years. But the thing I can't get my head around is the primitive technology that they did that with. You know, the, the sort of processing power that I have um, on my phone that is recording this talk now, if I was to be able to hold it up, you know, that, that processing power is not dissimilar, even probably faster and better and more competent than the huge computers that filled rooms that put man on the moon. You see, humanity, our progress is quite astonishing, isn't it? Uh, do you know you can buy a Tesla if you have an awful lot of money? And uh, a Tesla is a car that dri can drive itself on the roads. You know, this is not the future. Right now, there are cars around this country that are dr being driven on our roads by computers. Now, some of the YouTube clips I've seen online doesn't necessarily convince you that it feels all that safe, right? Hear that. But the technology is astonishing. And yet, with all this progress, and I guess the pride that we can have in where humanity is this feeling of invincibility. Nine months ago, in a wet market in Wuhan, someone ate a bat, probably. And now we are in this situation. You know, we'd love to be united together as a church family, and it's wonderful that people will be able to meet centrally, and we're really sad there are people in homes all around uh, Norwich who can't be with us yet, and that's wise and, and you know, we're, we're looking forward to the point where we can be back together. But why has that happened? Because of a bat. Someone ate a bat. It's incredibly humbling. You know, I'm not saying that um, the virus has come because of our pride, but it certainly has humbled us. Proverbs uh, 16, 9 uh, 1618 puts it like this, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. You know, we, we know what being proud means. Uh, it's being full of yourself, it's being self-conceited, it's thinking I'm in charge and I'm better than everyone else. Uh, the word proud in or pride in uh, the book of Proverbs is it, it has this feeling of, of being filled up and overflowing, uh, like you'd put a, you know, filling up a cup with water and it just overflowing, overflowing. He says, that is pride, being overflowing with myself, overflowing with my self-worth in comparison with you. And in this final talk in the Proverbs series, we're moving on to a different one next week. We're thinking about what Proverbs has to say about pride. And I think the first big thing is this, pride uh, messes up our relationship with God. Let me read Proverbs 15, 25. The Lord tears down the house of the proud, but he sets the widow's boundaries stones in place. You know, here we read that God is bothered by our pride. And so he will ultimately tear down the house of the person who thinks this is all come to mine, come to me by my own effort. You see, pride, the sort of bigger picture uh, of this proverb really is that pride is something that is fundamentally anti-God shaped. Jonathan Edwards, the 18th century New England uh, Puritan, describes pride as being the first sin. Let me read this. Pride is the worst viper that is in the heart, the great disturber of the soul's peace and sweet communion with Christ. It is the first sin that ever was. You know, what was going on when Adam and Eve were being offered that fruit in the garden? Uh, Satan was saying to them, what was, pro what was he promising to them? Uh, Genesis 3 verse 5, uh, they would be like God, 
knowing good and evil. And there they were, they were being confronted with a choice. Um, are we going to continue to be subordinate to God or are we going to walk around taking his mantle, being little gods myself, little gods themselves, answering to nobody but themselves? What was the desire that made them take the fruit? Well, it was pride. They took the fruit saying, I know better than my creator and actually I can do better than my creator. See, in that moment, as they grasped to be like God, actually what they got back was the dehumanizing effects of sin. See, it's not just our first sin. Uh, C.S. Lewis, um, in his book, Mere Christianity, also describes it as our greatest sin. He says this, uh, there is one vice which no man the world um, is free of, uh, which everyone else in the world knows when they see it in someone else, and of which hardly any people ever imagine they are guilty of themselves. The essential vice, the utmost evil is pride. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice it is the complete anti-god state of mind see the point he's making here is that pride is something that we all struggle with whether we acknowledge that or not we can all see it in other people it's so obvious in them but for us no i'm okay i'm okay even the most humble person he says struggles with pride and it's not just we all struggle with it um it is the starting point for every other sin it's the starting point for every other mess um, that we make in our lives Uh, it is so deep rooted it is the greatest of sins and so um you know when you're there and you're in the car and someone cuts you up and you bristle that they should do that or you're at a party and someone snubs you doesn't speak to you ignores you or maybe uh, someone t- talks to you about something and it's really patronizing uh, that feeling we get deep down inside the kind of animosity and it's pride it's pride that drives that because we like to see ourselves as above other people Uh, What right do you have to tell me? You know, do you not understand who I am and my DIY skills? Do you not understand how good I am with a hammer and you're trying to tell me how to use a hammer? You know, our pride makes us feel above others. And I guess as we've been saying again, it's the first sin, it's the greatest sin, and it means that I don't want to put God on top. Uh, I don't. I don't want to put him before me. I don't want to put others before me. I'm going to be at the center. My energy and my achievements, they're all going to be towards my own personal glory. And you see, as we set ourselves up in pride, uh, we are actually cutting against the grain of the universe. And we're cutting against the grain of what we've been created for because you and I and the whole universe have been created for the glory of God, for his praise, for his honour. And so unsurprisingly, our pride messes up our relationship with our creator. Or secondly, also pride messes up our relationships with each other. And there's three proverbs we're going to, three sort of big focuses we're going to see um, from the book of Proverbs on this, how it affects our relationships. Um, firstly, pride causes us to look down on others. Just have a look at chapter 30, verse 13. And here he's describing another, um, in, a, in the context of this, he's describing another, a number of sins. But listen to this one. Uh, Those whose eyes are ever so haughty, whose glances are so disdainful you see the haughty eyes it literally means they lift up their eyeballs they look around the room and are automatically judging well that person's below me and look at that person and how can that person get their life in such a mess when i haven't done that 
so easy to, with haughty eyes, look down on other people. In fact, to judge them, to dismiss them without any sort of empathy or sympathy, not understanding anything for their personal story, what has led them to that point, or even having any acknowledgement of maybe some of the privileges that have contributed to you being at your point, haughty eyes. But what is even worse with haughty eyes, we don't see people as equals. We dismiss them. We don't see them as um, equally created in the image of God, but we see them as objects to our own ends. You know, pride means I'm so consumed with myself and my own agenda that when I see someone else suffering, I'm left thinking I'm far too smart to have ended up there. But there, by the, by the grace of God, go I. Pride fails to recognise that without God, we are nothing. And all we are and all we have is under his provision and sovereign hand. See, pride affects our eyes. But also, it just causes us to fall out. Have a look at um, 13 verse 10. Where there is strife, there is pride, but with wisdom is found in those who take advice. You know, whenever you see strife or conflict and fallout in relationship, you can almost guarantee it is as a result of pride. Pride in one party or most likely pride in both parties. Now, look, we've been through a really stressful period, haven't we? And uh, it's looking like the pain is not going to end anytime soon. And loads of us will have felt really strained in our relationships. Um, there will be marriages that will feel like we are clinging on by the tips of our fingernails. Uh, there'll be relationships with with um, flatmates or maybe family members or mums or dads or um, work colleagues that really will have hit the rocks. And as you look back over the past few months and you think of some of those tensions and some of those arguments and some of those that build up of pain, how much has it been to do with pride? You know, either you won't admit you've done something wrong or maybe you've not been gracious enough to let someone have a different view to you and talk it through with you. You know, I guess one of my reflections is, having been in a number of different churches over the years, that um, sadly there can be strife and unresolved tension uh, within churches. And it, sometimes it can be, you know, hidden behind, oh, it's a zealousness for the truth or a passion for the lost, or whatever it may be, this, this tension that has come, but so often it is to do with pride. You know, someone's failed to admit they've done something wrong, or people have lacked grace in the way they've dealt with others, and pride has brought the conflict. Well, do you see what the proverb says? What does it say? 13.10. The one who has wisdom takes advice. You see, um, willingness to learn, humility to seek others' input, to not be so proud as to not seek and accept help can, call, can help work out some of these things out. Um, another thing we see, pride often comes before disgrace. Um, 11 verse 2, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. This is one of those verses that highlights the problem of pride. If I go around thinking I am above other people and actually above what God says is right, then it leads to me behaving in ways that ultimately brings disgrace. And, you know, I was just reflecting on this proverb and, and you know, I don't have to name uh, the number of high profile ministers who um, have allowed their position to go to their head and it's and it's it's led them to disgraceful unfaithfulness i was reading a chapter in a book on humility uh, about uh, this guy talking about someone who had joined their church 
and there'd been a massive fallout in his last church and they were talking about what was the difference between the two churches and both churches um, loved the cross and Jesus' death them. Both churches loved the word of God. Both churches loved singing God's praises but the big difference between the two churches is that one church really valued humility in their staff and their eldership that was the thing that was prized and it made a massive difference but even there we have to be careful you see humility can be used in a prideful way do you know what i've we are i'm so humble i'm so humble and look at them look at them look how proud they are judging others by my astonishing humility um, you know it's gone wrong one of my friends joked um, when you are about to write the book humility and how I achieved it see pride can make a mess of so much it can make a mess of our relationship with God it can make a mess of our relationship with others our haughty eyes the way we are viewing them we are judging them or the strife it can bring uh, the disgrace that can be hidden behind um, pride how do we overcome it you know what do we do about the mess of pride and at this point I could say well you know we've had lots of lessons there you just need to be more humble uh, you need to listen a bit more uh, you need to realize that um, strife uh, in your life is maybe not necessarily the other person's problem but maybe it's because of you and all those things are helpful but actually we need something bigger then try harder to be humble. See, if pride is something that is foundational and fundamental, it's a sin that is ingrained in all of us from the Garden of Eden uh, through history to this day, it's not something we can fix. It's not something that we can change. We need Jesus. We need our Saviour. We need the King that Proverbs points to, the humility of Jesus who doesn't consider his divinity as something to be used to his own advantage, but in humility makes himself nothing, giving his life in humble service on the cross. See, he willingly pays the price to free proud people who are anti-God, and have been given over to conflict and disgrace so that we can be forgiven. We can be restored to our maker and transformed and sanctified into the image of Jesus himself. You see, we need a king who is perfectly humble, who can serve and change us. You know, we're studying Mark's gospel in small groups, in our connect groups. And if you're not a member of a connect group, please join one. Um, it's going to be a great term. And this term we're going to see Mark 10, 43 to 45, and it says this, Not so with you, this is talking about in the context of people arguing about greatness, Not so with you, instead whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You know, maybe you think, yes, my pride has made a mess of my relationship both with God and with others and I cannot fix it. And do you know what this verse says? That is exactly the place you need to be. See, Jesus has come to give his life for people exactly like that and he has come to change us. See, as we look at him, as we meditate on the one who humbles and serves us to the point of death, you know, the implications of that is our vision of him will grow and the vision of ourselves, our pride, with the Spirit's help will shrink. See, humanity as a whole has been humbled by what has been going on in the world this past year. But as we look to the cross, and the resurrection as we reflect on the gospel we find not only the source of humbling for our hearts but also the cure and answer to our pride problem 
Let me lead us in prayer. Father God, as we chew and reflect on pride, um, we, when we're honest with ourselves, we know it is a problem in all of our hearts and it just keeps coming up in so many ways. Father, thank you so much for the humility of the Lord Jesus that even though he was equal uh, with God, even though he was God, he was willing to lay his life down and become a servant, dying the worst of deaths for us. Father, we pray that as a church, and as individuals, we will come to know uh, the cure for our pride, the forgiveness for our pride, but also as then we continue to meditate on his service of us, that you would make us more like Jesus in the way we serve others and serve you in your glory and put to death our prideful, selfish ambition. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.